Uh, so it looks like attendees are still coming in, uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So the subject of the webinar today is how to move to the cloud using VMware. Uh, and again, I'll qualify that name a little bit. Uh, we, we're not going to get incredibly technical in this session. Uh, we're talking more about the benefits of a VMware private cloud, some of the use cases of cloud overall, and why Liquid Web has chosen VMware for our private cloud option, and what we think those benefits are that you can see as you move current workloads to a VMware private cloud. Again, we're recording. Any questions you guys can put in chat. Myra will be helping monitor chat for me. <clears throat> so we will start with who I am. Uh, so my name is Kelly Goolsby. I'm Director of Enterprise Sales and Solution Architecture at Liquid Web. I've uh, been in hosting for approaching 17 years. Um, been at Liquid Web for about a year and a half of that uh, and pioneered, pioneered, uh, I basically identified a need that we could serve for our clients with VMware uh, and then helped sort of from the, the inception uh, build a business case uh, and a technical model for Liquid Web to deliver a private cloud based on VMware uh, that we could build out and design for our clients. I launched that product several months ago. I did an earlier webinar that was a little more technical. Uh, this one's going to delve into some of the, the benefits of border on technical, the business case, cost of ownership, uh, and what we believe the differentiated experience of a private cloud with VMware is. Uh, I do have a passion for helping small businesses succeed. In my history in sales and solution architecture, I've worked with all size clients from, from single owner startups uh, to the Fortune 500. Uh, in particular, what I like about Liquid Web, we tailor to small, medium, uh, approaching larger businesses, SaaS, uh, a lot of designers and creators. Uh, and they were not initially really the target for either VMware or the larger public clouds. Uh, I believe that what we have done with our VMware private cloud offering is really tailored to those smaller businesses that are growing, that are delivering more applications, uh, more customer-facing workloads through the cloud. There's my email, uh, happy to take email, I answer them all day. So if you guys have any questions about any technology, including VMware, feel free to grab my email and reach out. I love talking any anything technology. <clears throat> so what I wanted to preface this with, obviously we know public cloud is growing, right? You can't look at an article without seeing uh, uh, the staggering growth of the public cloud providers. Azure, obviously, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, uh, Liquid Web's own public cloud, all growing. Uh, the industry growth rate by uh, the IDF um, in 2019 was posted at 56% on infrastructure spends year over year growth for the public cloud, the hyperscale public clouds. Uh, what is interesting about recent numbers is that private cloud is still growing, obviously not as exponentially as, as public clouds, but private cloud still has an incredibly healthy 28.3% growth rate. So both segments, public and private cloud, are growing. And so to capture that, obviously Liquid Web has a public cloud, uh, but we saw a need for private cloud and how it can meet some of our clients' workload needs. And we have clients migrating, and we'll have a case study at the end uh, that actually features a particular client uh, who's using our VMware private cloud, what their business problems were and why. So we'll get to that toward the end of the presentation. So forgive me, I talked pretty fast, so we might end up with more time for questions. Uh, but if anybody wants me to go back over anything, again, Myra will be monitoring chat. Uh, I think most people know by now the benefits of moving to any cloud. Um, and you tend to find when we talk to customers, cost savings tends to be what people think of first. And while that's true, it's certainly not the only benefit of moving to public or private cloud. Uh, and in some cases, cost savings can look a little bit different than people think initially. Uh, we do a lot of cost analysis for clients, and the cost savings of a public cloud are certainly there, sometimes for small to medium deployments, uh, static workloads, uh, you know, things that haven't been born in the cloud. Those cost savings aren't as pronounced on public cloud as you might expect. And we can talk about some of that, probably not getting into detail on this webinar. Uh, kind of at the top, and if I look at this diagram, time savings are huge, right? I think everybody has worked in IT where you had to go order servers, right? You order servers from a partner, you order them from Dell, you buy them on Newegg, whatever. Uh, they take a while to get in, they take a while to get racked, right? This is the same argument that hosters, technology companies have been making for years. 
um, the, the TCO of an OPEX model, both from a cost standpoint and from a time saving standpoint, right? Uh, but the birth of more internet enabled applications have made those time savings even more pronounced, right? Um, you can't spend three months getting orders for hardware in to test a new application, right? So public or private cloud allow you to save time, develop applications faster, bring them to market faster, and fail fast, right? So if you want to experiment with something, you can do that. You can do it much quicker on a public or private cloud. I would also say uh, freeing up resources is an important one. And those resources could be compute, uh, storage, networking resources. They're also human resources, right? The less time you spend managing servers, managing deployments, the more time you have to develop those critical business applications. So capacity on demand is an interesting one. Uh, it does tilt more toward the public clouds, right? Public clouds are an infinite, nearly infinite pool of capacity that can be spun up in minutes. What we find out though, a lot of our clients that think they need that capacity on demand really just need faster capacity, right? Faster than racking a server or even ordering a, a dedicated server for a small application from a host like Liquid Web. Private cloud gives us capacity on demand, a little bit different than public cloud, right? It's not thousands of servers sitting waiting on a request, but it does give you the ability within a finite pool of resources to add capacity re-architect, resize, uh, change VM attributes so that you do have more capacity on demand inside a known pool of resources. Um, flexibility and control is incredibly important. Uh, with DevOps, you know, and DevOps methodologies, and we've been hearing about this for years, more and more companies are allowing developers to deploy apps uh, and manage those apps and make changes to those apps without going through central IT. Uh, we believe that public and private cloud allow a lot of flexibility and control of individual workloads, individual VMs. Finally, increased security. And I'm not here to say, you know, public clouds, obviously huge bounds in security, uh, but it is different, right? The way you secure applications, servers, and workloads in the public cloud is much different than you would on a private cloud, right? A private cloud, you can tailor individual security plans and pass for your needs, uh, you're not sharing any resources, so there are some benefits uh, to security. And in public or private cloud, your security, at least at the data center and the infrastructure level, is off of your individual staffs, right? You could worry about security of applications rather than security of infrastructure. So, excuse me, and I'll move forward to slide. So, we think some Liquid Web VMware pri private cloud differentiators we want to talk to you about. Um, this is a truly managed private cloud. Uh, Liquid Web manages the infrastructure, all the hardware, and all the VMware virtualization platform. Uh, and we manage, in a couple models we'll talk about in a minute, but in our fully managed model, we're managing the operating systems on the VMs themselves in much the way we would with a dedicated server uh, or a managed public cloud today. All services are monitored 24-7. Uh, this includes individual VM responses, resource utilization of those VMs, and the underlying hypervisor infrastructure. Uh, really important. Uh, this is a well thought out design. When we build a private cloud, from day one, you work with a solution architect uh, to determine workloads and make sure they fit, uh, they perform correctly on a private cloud, uh, and they can fail correctly. So one of the benefits of, of especially VMware private cloud is really baked in availability. Um, we can talk about some of that at a webinar that I did earlier, digs more into the technical, uh, how things like vMotion and VMware HA work. Uh, but we help manage that. We help architect uh, and build for failure. Um, second benefit that we see that differentiates the VMware private cloud, it's efficient and secure. Uh, we are deploying a single tenant private cloud solution per client. Uh, our, our packages, and you can see these on our website, are bundled uh, so that you don't have to make all of those design decisions. We can tailor, uh, but we include a firewall, we include a load balancer, uh, and a dedicated vCenter uh, so that the control plane, essentially, of your VMware private cloud is isolated. Uh, it does a couple things. It helps safeguard your data, uh, but it also reduces the failure domain. So. We're certainly past the days of the large public clouds having huge widespread outages, 
Uh, but typically when there is an outage in public cloud, uh, it can be complex, uh, difficult to resolve uh, because of the complexity of the underlying systems. Uh, in this model, our dedicated vCenter is designed for you. Uh, if there is any issue that we can troubleshoot that individually and quickly in your own private cloud, and we'll talk about it in a slide coming up right after this, having a dedicated vCenter per client gives us the ability to customize, right? There may be things that are, are nuances of VMware that you want to run in your environment that if we were running this in a, a shared vCenter, we would not enable across all of that infrastructure. Uh, but with a dedicated vCenter, we can make some decisions uh, that allow us to customize, to do add-ins, uh, to even change things like backup for you, right? So it enables that uh, and it gives us the ability to iterate the product quickly. Uh, finally, performance built to last. Um, we're using uh, high quality premium server nodes, uh, NetApp, all flash storage on the back end. Uh, a lot of different ways to, to build a private cloud, especially on VMware. Uh, we chose NetApp uh, for its efficiency uh, and all flash simply to, to have a baseline of performance uh, that gives you maximum speed, scalability, and reliability. Myra, any questions yet? Um, nope. Not yet? Not yet. All right. Feel free to queue those up. Uh, so I did want to, again, without getting incredibly technical, give you a quick overview of, of a representative architecture of what our private cloud uh, VMware solution looks like. Uh, I think probably most people now have some experience with VMware, uh, but across a 10 gig private network, we have NetApp, uh, all flash storage that I mentioned, uh, any number of server nodes, we start with two. Uh, a very specific design decision was made with this product uh, that we would only do HA. So we're not doing a, a single server, right, with, with all your VMs packed onto that single server, and if that server fails, then you're down. Uh, it's certainly the way a lot of people start building out VMware, uh, but it doesn't really take on any of the definition of a private cloud, uh, but essentially two server nodes. And then through, through some VMware uh, tooling uh, and thoughtful design, we decide which applications, we and VMware, decide which applications uh, should run on which server node. Uh, we do build typically so that if a single server node fails, all of those VMs could run on the other server node uh, until with our hardware SLA, we replace that server node, redistribute the VMs across both nodes, and you continue running. Uh, as you expand, and we'll talk about it in our client use case later, uh, two, three, four server nodes, uh, then you build up more resiliency, uh, more, more isolation from failure, things like that. Um, we can make a lot of design decisions for you here. If you have some applications or some operating systems that don't need to run out of failure, we don't have to bring those back up. Uh, so we use the, I mentioned vMotion, uh, we use uh, the resource scheduler in VMware, uh, we use a product actually or a feature of VMware called HA Access Control that when you go add new VMs, right, when you make a decision, do you need a, a developer needs to spin up another virtual machine, uh, we make sure that it can still maintain the proper failure and performance rates before that VM is added, right? So we talk about a private cloud, you have a known predictable performance, we're managing that performance, monitoring to make sure you're still achieving that performance, both at the VMware infrastructure layer and at the, uh, the application layer. So moving forward and a big bullet list here, uh, what I wanted to talk about in general are the two VMware options. And, and so far we've seen a lot of traction with the first option, which is fully managed, right? We manage the underlying hypervisors. It's a product I've really been talking about. We manage the guest operating systems uh, and then into the application stack on those operating systems and we monitor them for you. Uh, we handle VMware installation and configuration all the VMware updates, the SAN, VMware snapshots, and sort of the image repository, right? We build up images or build uh, stock images for your, for your VMs. Um, and we can do custom images as well. If you guys or anyone has a particular need for custom images within limitations. What is unique about this product is that in our fully managed option, we are giving clients vSphere access. So some of the things that we can either do for you or you can do yourself, uh, we're giving you access to do things like 
uh, view individual resources on VMs, on hypervisors, uh, stop and start virtual machines, uh, console into machines. So if you need to recover something really, really fast, obviously you can call Liquid Web, uh, but you will have access to the console into machines. A dedicated account team. Uh, and then again, I mentioned uh, managed, fully managed, supported uh, Windows, CentOS uh, images. Uh, we are handling backup of virtual guest machines, patching those machines, and system administration of guest operating systems. What is unique and the reason we did dedicated vCenter is we have the option to fully manage all the VMware infrastructure, uh, but let you spin up your VMs, right? You get full access in this case to uh, the to vCenter uh, and vSphere. And so you have Liquid Web manage the underlying infrastructure. Uh, we're still gonna provide consultation, uh, but you have control of deployment of guest virtual images and the ability to launch pretty much any custom image you like. Um, and so this gives you the ability to do things that you may not be able to do in the fully managed option. Uh, we are seeing traction on the second option uh, for cent smaller central IT departments, uh, people that want, you know, they have VMware in-house right now and want to build up a, a disaster recovery as a service uh, using a managed VMware, um, but then have their own, their ability to replicate VMs from their infrastructure VMware in-house to Liquid Web. So those are the two options. Again, most of our clients so far have wanted the fully managed hosts and guests, <laughs> excuse me, but we are seeing demand for fully managed VMware uh, with customer managed guest operating systems. Forgive me, drink here. Um, we wanna talk next about how we provide a better experience with a hosted private cloud. And some of these we've talked about, uh, but we do, uh, a private cloud allows for a high degree of customization, and we are just starting to figure out all the types of customization that are gonna happen with VMware. Uh, our VMware architects are currently building a roadmap uh, to decide which of the, the features of VMware we think are valuable for our clients, and that is based on client demand. Uh, but you know, right now, you certainly have the ability to help us form a private cloud product, and we can tailor individual needs, uh, so things like VMware or VM level encryption, uh, GPUs, uh, pretty much anything. Because we're a dedicated vCenter, we're willing to consider and build out a private cloud tailored to your needs. Security, and I think we talked about this and I hit on a little bit with control. It's single tenant, uh, so familiar security practices. Again, uh, in a public cloud, security tends to be at the application layer. Um, I know all clouds provide security of infrastructure, uh, but with a private cloud, uh, you can deploy uh, web application firewalls in the way you do today, uh, two-factor authentication, things like that are all possible, and you don't have to re-architect security best practices uh, to fit with a public cloud in that degree of access. So cost and performance predictability, uh, and this is a very common, um, I think it was actually coined um, by Zynga. Uh, Zynga was a huge public cloud consumer in the early days of public cloud. Uh, and through some of their analysis, they found out that for workloads that are consistent, uh, it tends to be cheaper to build a private cloud, uh, but for workloads that have enormous traffic spikes, public cloud certainly makes sense uh, when you look at cost at scale. And so that is referred to as own the base, rent the spike. I think most people have heard it. Uh, we really like that model. Uh, and I should mention that uh, we can build hybrid configurations that use a VMware private cloud and then have workloads in other liquid web products like our public cloud. Um, one thing that is unique about our product is we don't, in the, our private liquid web private cloud, we don't charge for individual VMs. Uh, so if you look at the packages on the website, they give some guidelines. Uh, we think our base package is, is appropriate for five VMs. Uh, some of our, our early clients have put 10 or more VMs, depending on size, uh, and then have the ability to resize those VMs with the underlying pool of resources. Uh, but other than things like licensing for Windows and any add-ons, databases, uh, we don't charge for individual VMs. All the cost is contained in the private cloud. Uh, so it gives you a lot of predictability around price. Uh, you're not uh, a you don't have a developer that goes and spins up three VMs uh, to test an application that all of a sudden there's a surprise bill. 
uh, ease of use, uh, and we can talk about this, uh, migrations to public clouds are increasingly complex due to the breadth of services uh, and the need to build for failure. Uh, so in any public cloud, typically, because they're built around uh, availability zones and the, the possibility that things could fail, uh, applications have to be typically refactored uh, so that you know, either either stateless or more stateless or build for, you know, auto scaling. Uh, typically, some refactoring of almost any application that wasn't built specifically for a public cloud has to be re-architected uh, to be performant in a public cloud. Uh, with private cloud, especially VMware, there is no need to refactor applications. Um, and so you can maintain high availability without completely rebuilding applications. So it's one of the main use cases for any private cloud, again, but especially VMware. Uh, consolidation. Uh, what we found with a lot of our clients, and you'll see it again in the case today, I keep teasing, uh, people are using more and more providers, which you think is, we think is great. Uh, what they're finding is the complexity of managing a lot of vendors is causing problems. And they may have clients at one vendor, uh, but a need for more resources with clients that are another vendor. Having a private cloud allows all those resources to be pulled and clients, VMs, workloads, applications to be resized again based on that underlying pool of resources. So, wow, this is an eye chart uh, and it's from a TCO piece that we have in our resources that you'll get when we send out the recording. Uh, but we actually break down the cost of a do it yourself configuration. Uh, versus hosting a VMware private cloud with Liquid Web. Uh, I won't dig into each individual number, uh, but it does give you kind of a highlight of some of the things you have to buy if you do this yourself. Uh, and again, people may reuse hardware, but we're looking at a net new workload. Uh, the cost of buying servers comparable to what are in our VMware private cloud. Cost of a firewall, switch, uh, HA SAN storage, VMware licensing, the cost to colo that. Uh, maybe a little less expensive if you have your own data center, but there's certainly costs there. Uh, this does include, and this if we debate TCO, and I hear this a lot, it includes a VMware admin full-time. And we know it's true that not everybody hires a full-time VMware admin, uh, but there's usually some cost to managing that environment. Uh, there are some things that we don't even include in this, like a load balancer, but if you look at the overall cost, you know, spread over kind of a monthly of the do-it-yourself model. Uh, you see what a first year cost is, that obviously you amortize out a lot of those upfront costs uh, over one, two, three, four, or even five years. If you compare that to outsourcing to VMware, we're really looking at the monthly here. Our base plan, which can support five or more VMs, is $15.99 a month. Um, and that is a flat cost. Um, unless again you add some extra licensing for windows vms things like that uh, so it does show potential cost savings here obviously really really big when you consider a full-time vmware admin now i do know and my next slide actually mentions that no really diy right i want to do this myself i want to teach a current guy to do vmware or i have someone that knows vmware uh that's fine uh, what we usually see though is if you attribute some sort of cost right everyone even in your current it staff who who spends time managing an environment costs something right they're not developing an application they're not going and getting a certification for devops uh, but if we take kind of a industry accepted part-time vmware admin of course part-time costs a little more per hour than full-time uh, you kind of see a three-year and five-year cost and you still see a monthly savings and movement to vmware uh, obviously, if you amortize hardware out over five years uh, and have a part-time admin, uh, it's a little less pronounced, but you still see a cost savings of moving to Liquid Web. Uh, part of this is a very simple total cost of ownership analysis. It doesn't include things like training and certification, uh, spares for hardware, so a lot of costs. I would encourage everyone, if you want to, to read uh, the full TCO piece that breaks all these costs down and talks about some of the... Uh, the hidden costs too, or benefits. Breakneck pace here. I did want to get to the case study and leave time for questions. Uh, so this is a, we'll call it an abstracted case study. We're talking about a particular client uh, who is buying a VMware private cloud from Liquid Web. Um, we did uh, take the name out. So we just want to talk to you about the company type. 
Uh, they're a mid-sized digital agency. Uh, they host a variety of applications for small and medium organizations. Uh, they came to us uh, with kind of these business needs. Uh, they run a lot of internet-facing brand sites uh, and internal business applications for all size organizations. Uh, they had a mix of operating systems, Windows, uh, Linux, uh, various types of applications, uh, multi-tenant uh, uh, office applications, uh, internet-facing e-commerce websites. Uh, they build out catalog sites and inventory systems. Uh, and they're constantly innovating, right? So I think five or six years ago, they basically did websites. Uh, but increasingly, everyone has a website, uh, and they're building out more applications that plug into websites, mobile applications, business communication applications, and as mentioned, inventory management. Their challenges were well, a very fluid business, like a lot of us. Uh, sites and applications need to size up and down for seasonality, uh, for, you know, for internal applications when they add employees, temp workers, things like that. Um, and so they had a variety of, of hosting form factors, things in-house, things on public cloud, uh, some things at Liquid Web, and things spread around a variety of providers. Uh, and there was a cost to managing that. So they didn't feel like they were getting the best price uh, because they weren't spending everything or at least most of everything with a, a single provider. So they weren't able to leverage uh, sort of any, any economies of scale. Uh, and then it took a while, right? Just to understand where things were hosted. Uh, they had different contact mediums for different providers, uh, different SLAs with different providers, and certainly different performance. Uh, this organization had spent a lot of time moving clients, right? So certain clients were hosted for a different reason, a different provider, uh, and it was hard to map all that. So our liquid web solution for this client, uh, basically our, our base VMware package that we've talked about that's in our TCO, dedicated firewall, dedicated load balancer. Uh, this particular company wanted to spend more time building customer facing applications and not building out to manage complex applications in, in complex infrastructures. Uh, so everything that they had could be migrated fairly easily. Uh, through a few different, few different methods into a VMware solution. Uh, but what we're essentially able to do is mix Windows and Linux. Uh, we have a very high traffic site for one of their high profile clients uh, that is load balanced with dedicated MySQL, uh, but then a lot of other assorted uh, Windows and Linux VMs for pools of clients or individual clients. Overall though, they consolidated from five providers down to one liquid web, uh, some things still hosted internally, uh, reduce their aggregate or overall client spend by over 30%. Uh, we gave them the ability to resize VMs uh, with that same underlying resource pool as they add clients. Clients, you know, a business application is no longer needed, uh, or they develop a new application, or they have seasonality. Uh, and then they can simply manage the underlying resource pool, add to that pool, and then split it up for individual clients, right? The use case for a private cloud. And lastly, we provided HA without the need to re-architect all the sites and applications uh, because time was critical for this customer. So I said I wouldn't get too technical. Uh, this is where we have a little nod to technical and kind of show you what the overall product looks like. Uh, but a couple of HA firewalls, HA switching, uh, definitely accommodating for growth. Uh, the load balancer you see there for individual workload for, for the high profile uh, or busy site. Uh, we're still backing up their VMs uh, through our backup product. Um, and they certainly have a plan to add a third hypervisor as clients are added. Uh, and then a little extra from our base package, NetApp SAN on the back end. So a little more technical diagram, uh, but most of our packages look like, like some iteration of, of what you see here. So in summary, and I said I'd have 15 minutes for questions, and we certainly will, um, moving to public cloud or private cloud provides benefits, we think, for all size organizations. Private cloud is differentiated by isolation, performance, and HA without the need to refactor, as I've said a few times. Uh, in many case, cases, a private cloud can provide a better experience for internal and external users. Uh, and we've shown, and we can talk about this, I love to debate TCO, Private cloud managed by Liquid Web costs less than most DIY options. 
So again, uh, I feel like I talked really fast. So if anybody has any questions or there's any questions and in chat? Actually, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. And uh, as of now, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, just drop them in the chat uh, box. Uh, but before we do go into those questions, Kelly, I just we I noticed a few people joined uh, sure. after the 10 minute webinar. So we will will be recording the webinar and you will be getting a full copy of the webinar by tomorrow. So I know some of you joined a little late, you will get to see the entire uh, webinar. So first question we have here is from Chris. What are the migration options for moving current servers to the private cloud? So a few different options and we will talk through those. So Liquid Web does offer uh, managed migrations. Uh, some caveats to that depends on the workload and the way the application is deployed today. Uh, but that is essentially a, a data migration where we do an initial sync of the, of the application data, the database, uh, work with the client to change over DNS. Uh, but right before we do that, obviously we do a final sync to catch any rights to the database. Uh, that is typically an option that is, is included uh, for, for mostly our fully managed Linux workloads. Uh, we can do other data level migrations. Um, and I don't know, Chris, why you asked this question, but we do have the ability to do a turnkey migration, a VMware to VMware migration, uh, which is for current VMware, VMware environments where we're essentially, we go into the hypervisor, uh, migrate the files that make up a VM, they're called VMDKs, uh, and launch those as images into a liquid web environment. So is a second option. Uh, we'd wanna talk through, it works for, for certain workloads, uh, and is can be, it's actually simple in the data move part, can be a little more complicated in, in, in bringing over issues, things like that, that have to be troubleshot. Um, the other option is um, a, a migration service, uh, for some of our more complex client migrations, uh, we do recommend a third-party migration service that project manages, moves everything over. Uh, we can even look at an option of a uh, P2V migration. So for physical workloads, uh, a private to virtual migration where you take a disk image of a physical machine and virtualize that could be an option for some use cases. So three or four different migration options uh, that we would work through to see which is best for individual applications. Uh, thanks. And we have one from Jorge from Monterey, Mexico. Can you talk about moving data between on-premise and liquid web methods? Uh, so depends on how much data. Um, and I understand, you know, depending on where that workload is, uh, uh, bandwidth might be a concern. Um, so a few different ways, you know, typically, uh, during one of those syncs, uh, you would you would basically set up a VPN connection uh, and move data over. Uh, certainly, you're going to have data in both places in that type of scenario. Uh, and so at some point, you have to break that connection, do a final sync. Uh, but we've had clients that for large data sets, some of our, our oh, like recently, we had a, an office IT type application for a legal firm. Uh, so much data there, and a lot of it was data that's not used as much, documents, uh, PDFs, things like that. Uh, the manner there was very uh, late 20th century, right? Put everything on a, on a very large USB drive and uh, send it over to us. Uh, and so that can be an option as well. Uh, for some of our really large clients that are going to have, like for a DR environment that we architected, uh, there will be a, a MPLS setup, like a uh, either long-term or medium-term uh, private line uh, between our data center and their carrier, uh, so that data can be moved. So those are just a few of the ways you can move data um, for migration or for you know workloads that will exist in both environments. Hope that covered it. And then we have another question. We actually have two of these questions. I sure. think they're similar. Um, can this be used as a disaster recovery from a current VMware environment? It can. Uh, a lot of different ways to do disaster recovery in a VMware environment. Um, so without getting too technical, it can be used sort of as, well, definitely be used as DR from 
a current VMware environment with host-based replication, right? Where everything is replicated at the individual VM guest level. Um, in our, if you remember, I talked about, and you'll see it in the presentation, a fully managed option or a partially managed option with the VMware infrastructure managed. Uh, that tends to be a better type of deployment. Uh, one, it's a little, it, it can be a little less costly uh, from licensing, things like that. Uh, it can be a little uh, easier to plug in uh, software. So there are a lot of third-party uh, disaster recovery and backup solutions uh, for VMware. Uh, in our fully managed environment, we may not support those, but in the managed VMware, not managed operating system environment, you can use any of those, right? So if you have a uh, Veeam, a Zerto, Unitrends, any of the large sort of disaster recovery options out there, absolutely. Uh, the other option would be storage to storage replication. Uh, that would be a custom solution, but there are a variety of ways to use this private cloud as a VMware disaster recovery option, yes. And then we have another one here from Amir. Greetings, Amir. He says, what do you mean when you say you have to refactor applications for the public cloud? Yeah, I think I hit on this just a little bit. Um, you know, what we see a lot uh, with public cloud environments, wherever they are, is that the consideration of the public cloud is you have to build for failure. Uh, so any one availability zone in Amazon or, or section of a public uh, cloud uh, could go offline at some point. You don't see it as often, uh, but the, the and I'll, I'll talk specifically to you know, Amazon Web Services, the largest public cloud out there and one that I've architected for a lot. Um, an availability zone, which is a small data center, is built with the expectation that it could fail or components in it could fail. So when you build an application for AWS specifically, everything has to be replicated in two availability zones. Um, a little bit different in, and it, it's similar, uh, what we're doing with VMware HA is that we like everything to run on two hypervisors, uh, A side, B side power, that's all contained in a single data center and it's transparent to the application. Uh, so your, your individual operating system app level applications don't have to be aware of building for failure. Uh, they can be stateful, they can be built to run on a single VM. Uh, we obviously would like clients to take advantage of load balancing and other HA, uh, but if you can't do that, that application can't be re-architected uh, so that if a VM goes down, it can keep running. Uh, private cloud and VMware can make more sense, right? So depending on the application, there's always some level of refactoring, a little less complicated with web applications, certainly more complicated with databases. All right, and just a reminder, we do have a couple more minutes left. So if uh, we didn't answer a question or need more clarification, feel free to put it in the box. Um, we have one from Matt in Texas. Great uh, webinar, thank you so much for all the information, but what about true bursting? Ah, I knew that. So, and I think I mentioned this, and I'll be very transparent about uh, private cloud versus public cloud. Um, so if you really need to burst, right? And so it, we always like to define bursting. Um, so if you are running an unexpected flash sale, or you could have a thousand users, you could have a million users, and you don't really know what that's going to be, uh, public cloud makes a lot of sense, right? So private cloud, we can spin, spin individual VMs up in minutes. Uh, hypervisors can be added in hours. Uh, but what we can't do is take you from 100 users to a million users. Uh, that is certainly where the public clouds and the hyperscale public clouds really excel. Uh, so we always try with our architects to define burst. Um, and so you know, burst is, is unknown capacity needs, right? That all has to be managed programmatically so that an application can add servers. Uh, it's really sort of an infrastructure as code concept, right? My application gets busier, servers are added programmatically, and they're added from a, again, nearly infinite uh, pool of capacity via an API. So that is, is certainly a public cloud use case, uh, but often can be a hybrid use case, right? A mix of private cloud, and bursting into a public cloud. Thank you. It's a tough one at the end. <laughs> we have one more okay. from John. Uh, are there any pay-as-you-go options? 
Uh, so yeah, pay-as-you-go is another interesting benefit of public cloud. Uh, and so pay-as-you-go is, is billing down to the minute, down to the second, things like that. Um, I think it's an option we'll probably build at some point for our private cloud. Uh, today though, I think the way we got around that is not charging for individual VMs. So if you're able to forecast that capacity, going back to the last question, and you have a known capacity, but you need, you know, you need incremental spend in that. Uh, you can, you don't have to worry about pay as you go because we're not charging for individual VMs. Uh, but on our private cloud, everything is scalable, right? So, you know, we have clients that are going to need a lot of SAN storage. Uh, so the storage is is pay as you go, sort of in a a monthly or daily, right? If you need to add a bunch of SAN for a particular application, particular need, but you don't need it after that. Uh, you can release that SAN and not pay for it. So semi pay as you go on, on this option. Well, I think we got all the questions out. It helps that I talk incredibly fast. So if anybody has any questions, again, Kay Goolsby at liquidweb.com. Uh, happy to talk about individual use cases, et cetera. Oh, yep. Yeah. Final slide. Thanks, Myra. Uh, so there it is again. Uh, Kay Goolsby at Liquid Web. Love to take emails from anybody. Uh, some additional resources you'll see when you get the recording on our private cloud, common use cases, uh, enterprise performance for SMBs, great blog post there. And our TCO, if you really want to dig into those numbers, you can read the full TCO piece uh, there. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending.